Hello, my dear listeners, Pastor Alfred Fakato, I'm here bringing to you again the Word of God. And I'd like to thank you for tuning in again to listen to me. It's a privilege for me to speak to you. And today again, we I am excited at what I'm going to be talking about. We're going to be continuing in the book of John, and we're going to look at John chapter 9. I'm going to spend time actually reading through the story and making some comments here and there and some application that are important for us. Now, what happens here in John 9 is that Jesus heals someone who had been born blind, and it is great excitement. The man is excited. The people who used to see him uh, beg were excited. His parents are excited. But there was a group of people who were not excited. Guess who? The religious leaders. What? Yeah, the people who were teaching the Bible, who were teaching the law, they were not happy. And I presume it's because they, Jesus had not done this according to their rules and authority. And so they were challenged. Which begs the question here for me, or what I want to say is this, that be mindful of religious hypocrisy. Be mindful of spiritual blindness because it's very dangerous and can even take you to hell. Now these people were the people who were supposed to guide the people, who were teaching the people. They were the pastors, the, the priests, the prophets, the teachers of the people. But something great, the hand of God had just done something great but they were unable to recognize it because their priorities were set in the, wrong, in the wrong place. Maybe you go to church or maybe you don't, or maybe you're just a religious person. This is one thing I want to let you understand. In religion, Christianity, or other religions, people pray, people give, people do things, people do miracles. But the most important thing I want you to understand is that it is not those things that you do, even including the preaching that you do, that matters. But what matters is that your heart must be committed to God. You must have repented from your sins and be transformed by the Holy Spirit. That is the beginning point without which anything you do in religion is utterly useless. Jesus here will prove to them that you are spiritually blind because you cannot recognize the words of God and hence your guilt remain with you. Oh, wait a minute. Your guilt remain with you. Your sins are not forgiven. I'm a pastor. I'm a preacher. I'm a prophet. What are you talking about? Well, nothing you do matters, as I've said, unless you have been born again of the Spirit. And nothing you do for God matters unless you have put your faith in Jesus. And we look back in John chapter 6. After Jesus was talking to the people, the people marveled. In John 6 verse 28, they said, Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works that God requires? Pay attention to that question. What must we do to do the works that God requires? They ask Jesus. Notice his answer. Pay attention to his answer. Apply his answer to your life. Verse 29. Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. He didn't tell them, oh, go and be baptized. He didn't say, oh, go and give here and there. Or oh, do this or do that or do that. Or go and preach. No. The work of God, the initial work of God in the life of any person who claims to follow him is to believe in Jesus. What does that mean? You turn away from your sins. It is called repentance. And then you believe that indeed God sent Jesus and he died on the cross or hung on the tree in your place to take away your sins. 
When you place your faith in him like that after repentance, he grants you the forgiveness of your sins and grants you eternal life and seals you with his spirit. That is the work of God that you must do in your life to begin your journey with God. It's not about any other thing that you do. It's not whether you can go and preach. It's not whether you can give. It's not whether you are baptized. None of those things matters unless you have been born again. You have truly believed in Jesus. Now these people we're going to see here in John 9, where the Pharisees, they call them the Jews, the teachers of the law. And in John 3, we had seen the case of Nicodemus who was reported as a Pharisee and a leader of the Sanhedrin. He was a leader of the Jews and he had come to Jesus. Yes, he was a Pharisee, a teacher of the law. He had come to Jesus and flattered Jesus and said, Master, we see you a teacher come from God for no one can do these things except God be with him. And I praise God for Nicodemus that at least he recognized that. These people in John 9 did not recognize that. But what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? A religious teacher, a theologian, a pastor. Whatever you can call him in the ranks of religion. He told him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, or truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's where it begins. That is where the spiritual blindness is removed. Nicodemus did believe. And we see different actions from him throughout the, even in the book of John. But here in, the, in, in John chapter 9, these people had not been born again. They had not seen or received the power of God. They were filled with the power of religion. And so they could not recognize the works of God. So let's look at John chapter 9. Say, as he went along, that's he, Jesus, he saw a man born blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Apparently, there was some belief about if a person was born blind, was it his parents that sinned or was it him that sinned and was born blind? We're going to see the answer that Jesus gives at the end. Because we see that the Pharisees, perhaps, is what they taught. Jesus responds, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Now I want to tell you this. God has a work of miracle for your life. But you have to wait for God's timing. It could be now, it could be tomorrow, it could be later. But the timing of God's miracle in your life, whether it is healing or provision or whatever, His timing for that in your life is dependent upon when He will get the most glory from you. So trust Him. And wait, and your miracle will come. Whether it's healing, whether it's whether it's blessings, financial or otherwise, it will come like it came to this man. So Jesus had said that, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in his life. Wait a minute, he was blind. And God let that happen for his glory? Yes. We remember in the case of Paul, the Apostle Paul in, in 2 Corinthians 12. Paul was great. He was an apostle and he was a healer. He healed people. But he had a thorn in his flesh. That he asked God. He said three times I asked God, could you heal me? And God says, uh, no. My strength is, uh, 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 my grace is made sufficient. In your witness. So there is a time that God heals. There is a time that he does not heal. But it all depends on how he receives the glory. Yours will come. It may come. Or it may not. 
in this life. Expect it. And he will bring it at the time that it will bring him the most glory. That's what Jesus says here. Which also adds to the fact that we have to understand that miracles don't just happen. Miracles happen for the glory of God. Please, if he does that through you, don't make yourself like the person who is the miracle worker. No, it is the power of God that works the miracles and the glory goes to God. Not to me, who has spoken the word and you have received the miracle. The glory goes to God, not to me. I'm a messenger and any other preacher is just a messenger. Those things happen. These miracles happen so that God may receive the glory. This is for Jesus says, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You cannot, see, when you look at the life of Jesus, just like we're looking here in the book of John, you see his sense of urgency. In John 4, he told his disciples, don't say uh, uh, four more months and then the harvest. Look, the fields are wide for harvest. Go and do the work. Go now. Don't postpone until tomorrow. Do it now. Because the night is coming. Darkness is coming. Wickedness is coming. When no one can work. Verse 6. He said, having said this, he spit on the ground, made uh, some mud with his saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool soon. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home saying, So the blind man is healed. Wait for your miracle. It will come at this time for the glory of God. Believe my word. So verse 8 says, His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No. He only looks like him, but he himself said, I am the man. So there were doubts. Like, how did this happen that this person can see? He was always begging. The man confirmed that, no, I am the one who used to be blind. And so, verse 10, how then were your eyes opened? They demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus, met some mud, and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Salem and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Now one thing I want to just add to you here again. You have to have a connection with Jesus and desire him to do for you what you want him to do for you. He will make himself and his will known to you what you should do. Let me say it again. Your connection with Jesus will help him or guide him to do to you what he wants to do to you when the time comes. So trust in him right now. Put your faith in him and believe that it will happen. I've been following Jesus for 32 years. And I'm so amazed at the things that he's doing in my life. And I look at the times and then I understand, him. like, if he did this 10 years ago, I would never have reacted the way I'm reacting now. So the more you grow with him, the more you have faith, the more you trust in him, the more you see how he will act in your life. Whatever miracle that he will work in your life, he will work. Wait for him and he will do it at the right time for his glory. So he reported to them that, okay, Jesus healed me. Verse, uh, verse 12, where is this man? They asked him, I don't know, he said. So beginning from verse 13, now the religious people, the Pharisees, they heard about what had happened. Now these people were already stalking Jesus, watching him to catch him because he was not doing things their way. See, they brought they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had met the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Okay, the Sabbath day. 
So according to the Pharisees, Jesus should not have made that mud because that would have meant work. The Pharisees had elaborate laws regarding how you should keep the Sabbath. And they kept watching Jesus around. Like, no, you can't do that on the Sabbath. You can't do that. You can't even heal on the Sabbath. You can't do this. In fact, it's reported that they had about 38 laws just regarding, uh, remember, the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Therefore, the Pharisees, because it was a Sabbath day, the Pharisees also asked him and how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, listen carefully, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Now that's their reason for rejecting Jesus. But others ask, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? Pay attention to that question. How can a sinner do miraculous signs? So they were divided. And people, it will always be like that. Jesus said, I came into the world to bring division. Even in the family, there will be division. Because if one person believes and the other doesn't believe, there will be a division. Because when you believe Christ, you are in the light. When you don't believe Christ, you are in darkness. And darkness and light cannot mix together. That's the unfortunate reality. When people truly believe, it causes division. These religious people were divided on their opinion as to whether what Jesus had done, was it right or wrong, or the day he did it, was it right or wrong? So some thought he was a sinner, others thought, mm, no, God doesn't hear sinners. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. I mean, I'll just keep reading the story here to understand how it's actually developing. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. So, okay, now they won his opinion. Watch how they respond to his opinions throughout the rest of the story. The Jews still did not believe that. Oh, no, okay, I skip. The man replied, He is a prophet. Okay, that is the man's reply. The man whose eyes were open, he said, He is a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until the sent for the man's parents <laughs> the investigation continued is this your son they ask is this the one you say was born blind how is it that now he can see we know this there we know he is our son the parents answered and we know he was born blind but how he can now see or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. Now a footnote is given here, verse 22. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, of these religious people. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ or the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. They were excommunicated from the church if they had believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Now these are people who had the Old Testament who were teaching about Jesus, about the Messiah. And the Messiah was right there in front of them doing what the, the scriptures prophesied that he was going to do. Heal people, open their eyes. But they were blinded by religion to be able to recognize that this was the Messiah and they had plans against him and against anyone who would acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah. Verse 23, that was why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So they didn't want to say to be witnesses. They were like, okay, ask him. A second time, verse 24, a second time, this summoned the man who had been blind give glory to god at least they thought about that give glory to god they said we know this man is a sinner well really you made the conclusion that he's a sinner oh well because he healed in the sabbath is that the point then <laughs> he replied this man is i love him and i love this story and let me say one thing here 
The fact is, when Jesus has touched your life, when you have a testimony of what Jesus has done in your life, nothing on this earth can change your faith. Nothing on this earth can change your belief. It really doesn't matter what they say around you. This man knew that something miraculous, something magnificent had been done to him. He, had, he was born blind and now he sees. So he knew the power of God. No one. No one can change you if you have experienced and know the power of God. This is how firm this man was. That's what I love about him. Verse 24, he said, he replied, 25, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. <laughs> One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. They asked him, then they asked him, what did he do? To you, how did he open your eyes? You see how sin can destroy you? You see reality, you cannot accept it because that reality would mean that you're going to change from your wickedness to repent from your sins and actually acknowledge that truth. That's what these people were struggling with here. They were rejecting reality because they had hardened heart. And those hardened hearts were Religious heart. Hmm. Religious hypocrisy is the worst enemy of truth. The worst enemy of God. So they asked him again. <laughs> he answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples? Um, <laughs> that's a tough question to these religious people. Then they hurled insult at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. Huh? We follow the Old Testament. Not this your Jesus. Right? We are, Mo we are the disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. Couldn't they actually just investigate about Jesus, where he was born and how he grew up and what he was doing and the fact that the scriptures spoke about him. In fact, in, in John chapter 6, Jesus had challenged them. He, he had challenged them. And he had said to them that, No does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. He knew that the word of God was not in these people, even though they said they believe Moses or they believe the law. And Jesus challenged him and said, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that in the scriptures you have eternal life. But the scriptures are about me, Jesus. How can you miss it? That's how he, was, he had told the people. But they said, oh, we are the disciples of Moses. Well, if you are disciple, true disciples of Moses, you will know who the Christ is. Then the man answered, now that is, a remark that is so remarkable with the exclamation point you don't know where he comes from yet he opened my eyes we know okay listen carefully we know that god does not listen to sinners he listens to the godly man who does his will listen his conclusion very carefully nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So he had made his conclusion. Jesus is a prophet. Jesus is from God. He's not a sinner because he opened my eyes and I know that I was born blind. Yes, I said, when God has done a miracle in your life, no one can change your view of God. No one can change your commitment to God because you know that you know that you had this experience with God in your life. So after he said this, verse 34, to this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth? How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Okay, they threw him out of the synagogue. Now, listen to that first statement. They say, You were steeped in sin at birth. So when the disciples had asked the question, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? There was that teaching going around, and the people now bring out that teaching here. 
you were steeped in sin at birth. So because he was born blind, they thought that, well, he had sinned or his parents had sinned. So we see the conclusion right here. And then Jesus, uh, we conclude the story, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. And the man said, Lord, I believe and worship him. It's my prayer for you that you actually at this point realize that, yes, do I have or do I not have Jesus? If I don't have Jesus, would you believe in the Son of Man? Would you believe in Jesus and worship him? This man did. But then what happened to the religious people? Then Jesus stated, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. At some point Jesus had said that it is not those who are well who needs a doctor. It is those who are sick who need a doctor. Please, religious people, don't push people off from the kingdom of God with your religiosity because you think that you see. Let Jesus open the eyes of those who don't see, whether they're in the streets, whether wherever they are, because he died to save them and he loves them. And when Jesus had said this, he said some of the Pharisees who were there with him heard him saying this and asked, What? Are we blind too? <laughs> yes, you are blind. Yes, my dear religious people, without Christ in your heart, you are blind. Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin because you will repent. But now that you claim that you see, your guilt remains. Fellas, the danger of spiritual ignorance. Yes, I've said, you can sing, you can pray, you can be baptized, you can give. But make sure that you have begun right. That you can do the works of God. That you have believed. In Jesus, thank you for tuning in and goodbye.